Hi guys, this is Connie, back for more Connie Reads. Because I procrastinate, I know this may not be something that a lot of people want me to read, but I started it and I'm trying to be a finisher. So, we are on chapter two of Blindsided by God. Um, and I'm just thinking right now that this might be problematic because I'm a little sensitive to some of the topics that are happening in this book. So I'm going to try to keep reading and not get, not have the reaction where my face is allergic to feelings. But, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so let's see if Connie can read through something that might be a little bit painful. Chapter two, prepare to be broken. Church planning is popular nowadays, and most Christians have heard about it in one context or another. But for the uninitiated, Church planning, at its simplest, is the act of starting a brand new church. I became aware of it while in seminary in Los Angeles, when a pastor told me I would make an excellent church planter. I thanked him, but frankly, I had no idea what he was talking about. It's like being told you, were, you would be great at curling, that bizarre winter Olympic sport that involves sliding stones on ice. You have to go online and Google it first. Oh, so that's what church planting is. But over the next few years, the more I learned about church planting, the more I wanted to do it. And by early 2009, I finally felt I was ready. I resigned from my position as the college pastor of a Korean American church in Virginia and set out to start a new church in Washington, DC. The first step in this journey was to attend a church planners conference in California. There, I could receive some basic instruction as to what it meant to plant a church and what the process would look like. I, fly, I decided to fly there with my entire family, Carol, our two daughters, Sophia and Katie, and me, so that as a family we could soak in the church planting experience. Sophia was three years old at the time, a late walker, but an early talker and reader. She was in every way the prototypical first child, mild manner, eager to please, and with an uncanny ability to overhear every private conversation Carol and I attempted to have. <clears throat> Katie was one and a half, one and a half years of unadulterated silliness. She hardly did anything without wiggling, whether taking a bath, watching TV, even while potty training, making it an especially messy affair. We sat both girls down one afternoon in the living room of our townhouse and told them, girls, we're going to take a trip to California. Daddy and mommy need to go to a conference so that we can learn more about starting a new church because we feel that's what God wants us to do right now. Sophia, so eager to please, nodded her head vigorously to indicate that she understood everything we were saying. Katie, eager to imitate her sister, did the same. So we continued. And that means you guys will be going on a plane for the first time. Yay! shrieked Sophia. <clears throat> and yay! shrieked Katie, a split second after her sister. They jumped up and ran headlong around the living room. Katie really not knowing what was going on, but still elated to have a reason to wiggle with all her might. Carol and I laughed as we watched their antics, our arms around each other's shoulders. We had every reason to be happy that afternoon, including one that we had not yet that we did not yet share with the girls. Carol was two months pregnant with our third child. One I secretly hoped was a boy. <clears throat> the conference itself was similar to other Christian conferences I had attended. Colored stage lighting, a healthy selection of songs from Chris Tomlin, and lots and lots of free books. <laughs> but the centerpiece of this conference was the speakers, all highly regarded church planters who shared amazing stories of how their thousand person churches had started with only eight people and those eight had been family members. As they spoke, I began to imagine that one day I would be sharing my own smashing successes as a church planter at the same venue, inspiring the next generation of church planters. It was at that moment that I became convinced this was truly God's will for my life. It's funny how success stories always have a way of convincing us of such things while failure communicates only that we must have done something terribly wrong. 
but one of the speakers rudely interrupted my reverie when he dared to share a less upbeat lesson with us. Prepare to be broken, he intoned, an intensely cool guy with spiky hair and a leather bracelet on his arm. Actually, the bracelet was so enormous that I could, it could hardly be called a bracelet. It was more of a gauntlet than anything else, something you could imagine a hawk landing upon. I found myself idly wondering if gauntlets and hair gel were central to the church planning experience. If so, I would have to find a hop topic store later that day. He continued, prepare to be broken personally. Prepare for your family to be broken. Prepare for the people in your church to be broken too. Prepare for brokenness. The word hung throughout the room. These warnings made us all shift uncomfortably in our seats, as I think they were intended to do. I nodded solemnly in response and assumed a grim expression, the patented one that all Christians are supposed to wear when talking about something serious. But in truth, my melancholy was only superficial and short-lived. I honestly never stopped to ponder that speaker's words, although in retrospect, I really should have. The easiest type of wisdom to ignore is that which fails to coincide with our own plans and aspirations. Ooh, I need to highlight that. Um, <clears throat> that's not in the book. The rest of the trip was not very memorable, that is, until our first flight back to Dulles. It had been a smooth one for the most part, but on our descent, we hit incredibly tur incredible turbulence, the likes of which I had never experienced before. It started with a single shudder, one so violent that cups fell off the people's tray tables. Before an announcement could even be made that we should fasten our seat belts, the plane began to shudder and vibrate as it buffeted by violently turbulent air. During one particularly terrible lurch, my stomach heaved and I immediately grabbed the barf bag in the seat pocket in front of me, as, I, as did almost everyone else on the plane. While my nose and mouth were stuffed into the bag, I stole a glimpse at Sophia and Katie, and strangely, they were completely unperturbed. With very little experience on a plane, they probably didn't know that this much turbulence was unusual. It's interesting how novelty can sometimes serve as a viable form of courage. I like that too. But when I looked over at Carol, I was shocked by what I said, what I saw. She was doubled over in her seat, her head nearly between her knees. By her sides, her hands clutched the armrest so tightly that her knuckles stood out like little mountains, like a little mountain capped in pale white. But despite her grip, her hands and arms trembled violently as if she were trying to tear the armrest from their rivets, and she breathed in short, ragged gasps. I had never seen her like this, not on a plane, not ever. I was frightened for her and wanted to ask her if she was okay, but I just couldn't bring myself to lower the bag. I don't think it would have mattered anyway because I know that what her answer would have been. No. And then suddenly, mercifully, it was over. With a series of unsettling bumps, we were safely on the runway, slowing down to, the tax to taxi to the gate. The pilot came on the intercom and apologized for the chop, which I suppose is pilot speak for terrifyingly violent turbulence. When we finally stopped to disembark, Carol and I gingerly got out of our seats and walked with the girls towards the baggage, baggage area. My stomach had finally settled down enough for me to ask her the question I had wanted to on, in the airplane. Are you okay? You were shaking pretty bad in there. I know, she replied. She paused before continuing. I've never done that before, ever. It felt weird, like I didn't have control over my body. Peter, my whole body was going numb. I could tell that she was genuinely shaken by the experience, which shook me up in return. I immediately tried to get her mind off of things. Don't worry, we've landed and we're okay now, and the girls seem totally fine. I mean, look at them. It's like nothing happened. I laughed awkwardly and gestured to them as if she couldn't see them for herself. She managed a weak smile and drew a breath. You're right, we're okay now. Let's go get our bags. But as we wobbled on, I could sense that something was wrong, that she was still troubled by the experience. Even as we walked, 
walked. An anxious expression worried her face, as if she feared that something terrible had happened and we just hadn't realized it yet. The days that followed in the summer of 2009 were filled with preparations for the church plant, especially spending time in the city, exploring and getting to know different neighborhoods. One story from this time stands out to me. I was wandering through the city one afternoon and found myself in the Columbia Heights neighborhood. Columbia Heights was undergoing rapid development, with new condos being constructed, constructed at a frightening pace and a massive shopping center erected so quickly it was as if it had been dropped from the sky. A block away from the metro stop, I happened upon a church building that stood on a corner lot. The grounds immaculately kept, and a red for sale sign standing on the lawn. Now, seeing that I had no congregation and no money at the time, I had absolutely no intention of buying a church building. I was there on a total whim, nothing more. Out of curiosity, I took out my phone to call the number on the sign to ask how much the church was selling for. But before I could even finish punching in the numbers, someone tapped me on the shoulder. Now, since I lived in a sleepy Virginia suburb at the time, I was a little jittery about being tapped on the shoulder by anyone in DC. I made a bizarre sheep-like bawing sound and whipped around to find an older African-American gentleman regarding me curiously. He politely asked, excuse me, are you waiting here to meet someone? My heart pounding and ashamed of my sheep noise, the best I could do was a halting reply. Um, no. Are you? Oh, I saw you looking at our church's for sale sign and thought you might be coming to meet our real estate agent. At that point, I could have just told him no, sorry, that I was just walking around the neighborhood and would be on my way. But instead, in a, rare mo or in a moment of rare pluckiness, I told him my story that I wanted to plant a church in DC and we were looking for a neighborhood to lay down our roots. As we spoke, other men came walking down the street and joined our conversation. And before I knew it, I was talking to half a dozen men, the church's entire board of elders. I didn't know it at the time, but they were all gathering at the church for their weekly leadership meeting. And it just happened to be at the exact time I had come wandering down the street. They ended up giving me the complete and unvarnished history, not just of their church, but of Columbia Heights as a whole. They told me their congregation had been there for over 50 years, and many of them have grown up at that church as young boys. Before then, Herbert Hoover had worshiped there, their one claim to DC fame. But now they wanted to sell this building and reestablish themselves in Southeast DC, clear across the city. And I asked them why they wanted to move in the first place, and one man, tersely explained with a single word, gentrification, at which everyone grimly nodded. They said it didn't feel like they fit in with this neighborhood any longer, a neighborhood that had endured race riots, a hippie invasion, and drug wars, and was now being saturated with coffee shops, vegan bakeries, and men with skinny jeans riding colorful bikes, bike locks firmly shoved into their rear pockets. They felt like they were being firmly pushed out of their home by these invaders with wispy beards. Despite the somber tone of our conversation, we were mutually encouraged by this chance encounter and prayed together that God would continue to lead both of our churches. When I got home from that meeting, Carol was sitting at our dining table looking concerned. The thing about my wife is that she always hides her thoughts and feelings from others because she doesn't want to be a burden or inconvenience to anyone a trait she inherited from her mother. Carol would make an excellent poker player, and I, quite possibly, the worst ever. But this also means that if she's sitting at the kitchen table wearing an anxious expression, you know something is wrong. Immediately concerned, I asked her what was the matter. I'm spotting, she says, bleeding a little bit. It's probably nothing, but I want to get it checked out. We drove over to the hospital where, coincidentally, one of our close friends, Joe, was on duty in the ER. We told Joe that Carol was a few months pregnant, but she was experiencing some uterine bleeding, something that we had never occurred with her previous two pregnancies. A seasoned emergency room doctor, he calmly told us he would do an ultrasound right away to see what was going on. As Carol lay down on the emergency room bed, Joe prepared the ultrasound monitor, which uses inaudible sound waves to listen in on what was going on inside her body. Joe swept the ultrasound probe to different areas of her stomach. 
one moment by the belly, one by the hip, and back to the belly. On the audio transmitter, we could hear constant static, whooshes, followed by the static again. He was intently listening for something, and I strained my ears as well, although I had no idea what I was listening for. After many minutes of this, he finally put down the probe and sat down next to us. He gently put his hand on Carol's shoulder. Guys, I hate to tell you this, he said, but I wasn't able to find a heartbeat on the ultrasound. Carol, I'm pretty sure you had a miscarriage. We looked at each other and didn't say a word. Nothing like this had ever happened to us, and we didn't know how to respond. Joe continued, I know this is hard, but I wanna just tell you that this kind of thing happens all the time. All the time. Most women don't even know that they're pregnant before they've miscarried. It doesn't mean that you can't get pregnant again either. It's just one of those sad things that often happen during pregnancy. In a strained voice, Carol asked, how did this happen? Could it have been anything we did? It's hard to say, really. Honestly, we don't know why some pregnancies terminate like this. It can be for genetic reasons. It can be something in the environment. But the truth is, no one knows for sure. Unless you are not taking care of yourself or something physically traumatic has taken place recently, I wouldn't think about it too much. When Joe said this, I immediately thought back to the plane flight, how Carol was shaking uncontrollably. Could it have been the stress of that landing? Was it possible that she was in shock on the plane and that caused the miscarriage? At last, Joe quietly stood up and told us that if we needed anything to give him a call. We thanked him and stood up to leave. On our drive home, I didn't, I didn't have much to say to Carol, but I figured that eventually I would have to say something comforting or insightful to share with her. I just needed some time to process things. The rest of that summer was difficult for Carol. She had to adjust to the loss of the baby, a life that had been growing inside of her, which she had just started to cherish. Despite the fact that Joe had told us we could still get pregnant in the future, Carol began to give away all of our baby clothes and toys, convinced she would never get pregnant again. And then, eventually, as is the case with natural miscarriage, she passed the fetus from her body, a horrific end to an already traumatic process. Still, through all of this, I had little to share with her, no words of comfort, and no real understanding of what she was going through. My silence was not lost on Carol either. We got into many more disagreements than usual during this time, and during one of our dust-ups, she said how she felt like I didn't understand what she was going through. I was preparing a sharp retort when I realized that she was right. I didn't understand what she was going through. I couldn't sympathize with her, couldn't connect with her experience. I knew the miscarriage was supposed to be a big deal. I truly did. But it didn't feel like that big of a deal. Not to me. And because I didn't know how I should feel, I didn't know what to say. I know this hardly reflects well on me as a husband or as a pastor, but in my defense, my lack of response had nothing to do with a lack of love for my wife. It does, however, speak to my general lack of experience with suffering up to that point. Sure, I had my fair share of difficulty in life, some much of it self-inflicted. I had a strict childhood where a lot was expected of me, more than I was possibly able to achieve. I had had my heart broken several times by that point, which may not seem like a big deal, but for those of you who have experienced it yourself, it sure feels serious enough. And not long before then, I had lost a good college friend who, at the age of 25, died after a heroic fight against cancer. So I had always imagined that these struggles allowed me to identify and sympathize with anyone's plight. After all, I had suffered. But the miscarriage was the first moment I realized that this was not at all true. I couldn't even properly console my wife as she journeyed through the loss of our own child. How could I have foolishly thought myself an expert on the subject of pain? There were deeper depths, depths of suffering than I had ever experienced to that point, and I was nothing but a novice. 
I've learned that we should be very, very careful before we claim authority over anything as vast and ominous as suffering. So I take full responsibility for my lack of appropriate response to my wife's miscarriage and to intimidate and to intimate or into I'm so having problems with words and phrases. Wow, this is a long chapter. And to imitate anything else would be ridiculous. But at the same time, I wonder if church had something to do with it. To my knowledge, I never heard miscarriage addressed in church, except in a very passing and indirect way. I have certainly never heard a sermon on it or heard a church leader share publicly about experiencing one. Neither do I remember any references to miscarriage in seminary, although I did have several discussions on, wow, that's a long word, excuse me, supral, supral, well, there's no way. It looks like supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Supral alparaginiumism, it's as close as it's going to get, um, and other esto esoteric theologi theological concepts. Mis miscarriage was never discussed in any of the Christian contexts in which I most commonly found myself. The more I thought about this, the more it bothered me. After all, Joe, Joe had told us miscarriages were common, so common that they are the reason it is suggested that you don't share about pregnancy before a certain time, because there is still a strong chance that you might lose the baby in the first couple months of pregnancy. I could also clearly see that miscarriage could, marriages, the let's try that sentence again. I could also clearly see that miscarriages could be traumatic for women, as it was for my wife. Then why had I never heard this topic addressed in any meaningful way in any Christian setting? The church, fellowship, even in cemetery, for two decades. I think it has something to do with the word brokenness. I have honestly never heard brokenness used outside of the Christian context. Do a, do a Google search on the term, and references are almost exclusively Christian, except for one to IPv6 brokenness, which I'm guessing has something to do with the internet. But in Christian circles, it is a commonly used term, liberally sprinkled throughout sermons, songs, books, and even Christian conferences on church planting. It is a word that describes twin ideas of tremendous spiritual significance, the process by which God refines people, but also the attitude of humility that we take before God. It is a good word. But brokenness is also a euphemism, and like all euphemism, all, like all euphemisms, it distances us from reality. I have discovered that uh, Christians have something of a love affair with euphemism. This is an understandable and even warranted. Uh, this is understandable and even warranted as the Christian life involves theological or spiritual concepts that cannot be described in any other way. But these wonderfully poetic words can also be terribly deceptive ones, allowing us to bypass the need to mention harsh realities by name and so ignore their existence. With a knowing wink and a nod, we can talk about fallenness without having to talk about what fallenness actually entails. Incidentally, my computer's spell check function refuses to even recognize fallenness as a real word. When someone tells us to be to prepare to be broken, we can solemnly nod, but then go on our merry way, because that term, although serious in tone, is just vague enough to allow us to ignore it or at least not take it as seriously as we should, much like any other word of the Christian vernacular. It is a spiritual word that can be unfortunately disconnect, or that can unfortunately disconnect us with real examples of brokenness. That is, unless we go on to fill in the messy details that we choose to ignore. And then this is actually in italics. We're almost at the end, good grief, this is a long chapter. Prepare to be broken by miscarriage or by the terminal sickness of someone you love. Prepare to be broken by mental illness. Prepare to be broken by the prospect of having a child with deep disabilities or losing that child altogether. Prepare to be stricken by doubt, both in your calling and in your ability to follow that calling. 
Prepare to be smashed by people's criticism and disapproval of every choice that you make, no matter how well intentioned. Prepare to be imprisoned by fear of the, fa of the failure, fear of failure, fear of not living up to yours, others, or God's expectations. Prepare to be broken by, and it leaves it blank. So rarely, we so rarely bother to fill in that blank. This always makes me think of a time I visited the Department of Justice. I don't, offer, I don't often venture into that part of DC, afraid that I am going, <laughs> afraid as I am of being run over by oblivious tourists riding on segways. But a friend once invited me to a lunch near there, and I thought I would stop by to take a look. The walls of the DOJ are covered in huge murals depicting scenes from American history. One of the more striking murals, painted by John Stewart Curry, depicts a lynching. In the mural, a man holding a rope leads a mob in pursuit of a single man, flames burning in the background. And the only one standing between the mob and its prey is a judge, holding them at bay at the courthouse steps with a single upraised hand. When you think about it, <clears throat> Curry could have just as easily painted a symbolic scene that included a classic blindfolded Lady Justice holding her sword in scales, with her carved sandal stomping on a snake, but he didn't. He painted a lynching, a terrible but very real moment of failure from our history. And that way, we are not allowed to gloss over or remain disconnected from justice and its inverse. Injustice is not a theoretical idea. It is when a mob chases a man down, puts a rope around his neck, and hangs him from a tree for an assumed but unproven crime. That's injustice. I think it's important that Christians do the same and summon up the courage to call things by their proper names. We have to stop relying so heavily upon spiritual euphemisms to describe the hardest elements of our lives and recognize that a spirit of avoidance is not always the same as the spirit of peace. This is precisely what we find in the reinstatement of the Apostle Peter. After Peter denied Jesus three times on Good Friday, you would imagine that the compassionate thing for Jesus to do would be to let the whole thing slide and never mention Peter's failure again. That's what I would have wanted Jesus to do. But instead, Jesus directly and specifically reminded Peter of his failure by asking him not once, but three times, do you love me? A fact that pained Peter deeply. To us, this seems unnecessarily cruel, but without this confrontation, Peter could not be forgiven and restored and would never become the disciple that he was destined to be. True restoration demands that we travel through pain, not simply around it. Similarly, we need to say the words miscarriage, abortion, mental illness, and drug addiction. Not for the shock value those words hold, <clears throat> but so that we can look our issues straight in the face and deal with them directly and more effectively and without shame. If we do not and instead content ourselves only with speaking euphemistically, we leave people dreadfully unprepared for the reality of life and forego with the true restoration God desires for us. But I do not want to go too far in my criticism of the church. Surely not every church avoids this discuss the, such discussions. Like I said earlier, regardless of whether the church had taught me anything about it or not, the responsibility was on me as a husband to listen to Carol and figure out how best to support her. That was my job, my responsibility, and not the church's. Still, there are some moments when it doesn't matter how direct or honest you are about suffering, because nothing will prepare you for the enormity of what you face. Although words of wisdom are helpful, some things you just have to experience firsthand to have any conception of how frightening they are. And that is the end of the chapter. Whew, that was a mouthful. Be careful with that and enjoy, please, and thank you, and I will see you for the next chapter. Bye.